one. Welcome to Creature Geek, the special effects makeup podcast from the fan and pro perspective. I am Len Peralta. And I'm Frank Hippolito. And we are doing a show, man. This is great. We are both super, super busy. I know you yeah, have a we, lot of traveling. Yeah, we missed a show last week because uh, I was too damn busy. That's all. Yeah, yeah I, was up at, uh, I was up at Silicon Valley Comic Con with the Tested Guys. And, um, oh, come on, Len, turn your phone off. <laughs> <laughs> um yeah but so we're back hey and by the way i just checked the uh the patreon today and we're almost to the point where we're gonna have to do four shows a month oh we no just, yeah, that's we, crazy yeah we just got um we're up almost to that level so that means we have to do more <laughs> well thank you so much for doing that yeah. by the way uh you guys but, are gonna uh, force so we'll us just, to work we'll... harder <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we got to work harder. That's all right, though. We're, we're okay with that. We're, we we got some great guests. Just like tonight, yes. we have one of the, uh, an incredible guest. Uh, when you when you told me who today's guest was, I was like, oh my gosh, this is so great. So let me uh, let me do the proper introduction okay, for him. Go for it. Uh, you know, anyone born in the '70s and '80s and is a fan of horror and sci-fi owes today's guest a huge debt of gratitude. Uh, he is the writer and publisher of some of the most influential magazines in the industry, including Starlog, Fangoria, and Cinemagic, just to name a few. I actually used uh, one issue of Fangoria in my seventh grade debate class as a source, but what I wanted to do was show off the cool Rob Bottin thing images. So that's a little <laughs> message there. <laughs> uh, we, are, we are honored to have this legend on our show. Would you please welcome to Creature Geek the amazing Carrie O'Quinn. <laughs> Welcome to the show, Carrie. Yeah, thanks for coming out, man. It's delightful to be here. I love talking about the things that uh, I've been interested in since I couldn't even walk. So That's... just to like jump right in, because I don't even know the story. Like, how did all of how did all these magazines come to be? Like, how did where did this come from? Well, um, my partner and I were working in an art department of a magazine publishing company in New York City. Mm -hmm. And he was art director of a movie magazine. And I was art director of a romance magazine. <laughs> and we just met <laughs> under those circumstances. We were in, you know, the art pool with like yeah. a dozen people that were slaving away putting out these magazines. And that was back when you have to like cut everything out with knives and like paint and do paint rubber stuff cement. And, yeah rubber mm -hmm, cement right. <laughs> no digital publishing back <laughs> there then. was no a mouse was a, a dirty rodent in those days <laughs> yeah that was uh that was in the good old days and we literally pasted up uh, everything that appeared in print yeah but it was great experience i had been art director of the student humor magazine at the university of texas when i was nice. in a student there and then I started a magazine off campus for the whole Southwest Conference with a couple of crazy people. And we did that for uh, a year or two. And so magazines were kind of my world, but I was an art director. I was a designer. I was an illustrator. That's what I was interested in. And so one day uh, after I had gone on to another job and my partner, Norm Jacobs, had gone on to another job, he called me and said, let's have lunch. I want to talk to you about something. And he said, let's start a publishing company. And I said, Norman, that's a business. You and I are not business people. You know, we're, we're creative people. Uh, we I never even took a class in business in all the years I was at UT. And he said, yeah, but he said, you're one of those Ayn Rand guys. You like money. And I said, yeah, and you're Jewish, so I guess you like money. And he said, yeah. I said, fine, let's do it. So the only we the only magazine that what we started with was a soap opera magazine because at that time, I think there were sixteen network soap operas that were produced every day, yeah. and we knew that millions of people were dedicated to watching the stories of these people. So you're talking about like General Hospital and Young and the Restless, like that kind of stuff. Days of Our Lives, okay. All right. My Children. As the so world turns, light. you had to watch all that stuff. Another world, and you know, is it before the days of the Young and the Restless? Actually, oh, okay. that's when that started. I came out here to California to meet the whole production crew and the and the cast and everything, and that was kind of exciting. Oh. 
But what was done out here, there were only three, and one was Days of Our Lives, one was General Hospital, and I can't even remember the third one. It's not around anymore. Yeah. Not mm-hmm. uh, most of them have gone away these days. There's only a few sure, left. Right. Yeah. But we knew that there was a huge audience that supported companies like Procter and Gamble and and companies like that. They lived off of the soap operas. Yeah. That's why they were called soap operas. Really? Uh, mm-hmm. Because that's mm-hmm. what they sold was uh, yeah. basically household cleaning products to women. I never put two and two together on that. Yeah. <laughs> Detergent. Right. <laughs> that's right. <laughs> That's Laundry a, detergent, stuff well, like that. Colgate and and uh, and Parker soap. and Gamble were they owned some of the shows. So yeah, anyway, right. we started a magazine because this audience was not being taken seriously. They were everybody kind of laughed at the soaps and brushed them aside. There weren't even any daytime Emmy awards when we started because daytime television was considered trash. And so we started well, a be, magazine. To be honest, I mean, it kind of still is. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm we, joking, I'm joking. We did a little bit of changing on that yeah. because uh, we put out a magazine that actually had real articles, real interviews. The soaps loved us because yeah. we took them seriously and we appreciated the yeah. work that was done in that world. Yeah. And so they would let us come on stage. They would let have give us access to anybody we wanted to interview. And we start and we had our magazine had color pages in it. That was very rare mm-hmm. in those days for a fan magazine. But we put out daily TV serials. That was the name of the magazine. And it became mm-hmm. the best selling magazine in the field. And it actually kind of elevated the status of daytime television. And we were partly responsible for generating the very first daytime Emmy Awards. And in fact, it was done on the plaza at Rockefeller Center in New York. And we were invited to cover it exclusively. And we devoted a whole issue of our magazine to the very first ever daytime Emmy Awards. Wow. That's crazy. And what year was this? This was 1972 is when we started. Right, so a couple months okay. ago. Yeah, a couple of months ago. <laughs> and But, you know, I wasn't particularly interested in the soaps. I mean, first of all, I didn't have time to watch them. I was yeah. busy working. Yeah. Well, you were, were you like managing art director or managing editor? or like? What, like we what, were both what? publishers, but we also, because we, we both did the layouts. Yeah. We were sitting literally like you have right here at a, at a drawing table. Yeah. And we were operating our T-square and pasting up layouts while we were on the phone talking with printers and distributors gotcha. and advertisers. And we were doing business while we were working. Working. So you, you guys kind of mm. learned the business as you went just by diving in. Exactly. First. Okay. And to be honest with you, uh, we hit a winner with our first magazine, but the next magazine we did lost a ton of money. Oh. And so we had some winners and we had some losers and we learned as we went. I think one of the ways that you really learn anything is by making mistakes. Oh yeah. I think you What learned- was that magazine? What was that magazine? It was called TV Show People. What what okay. it was was TV Guide was a little you know pocket magazine that was sold at uh, the checkout counter at yeah. grocery stores, and we said you know we've covered daytime television now let's just cover television and do a magazine about <clears throat> the wonderful people that are involved in it, and uh, it'll be a big full size color slick paper TV guide. Without the mm. guide. Yeah, without the, <laughs> right. the right. channel listings. The listings, yeah. yeah. So we tried that, and it lasted for a little while, but it didn't It didn't go. And sure. uh, so <clears throat> literally about four years later, I said, you know, let's, let's do a magazine that I'm interested in, some, about something that I really care about. And so we started Starlog. Nice. At, and our distributor said, you're crazy. You're going to lose your shirts. Said there is no audience out there large enough to support a monthly newsstand science fiction magazine. He said, there's a few freaks that gather at a hotel. I mean, a few dozen people that put on pointed ears and get together at a hotel like once a year. That's not enough to support a magazine. He made that publisher eat his hat. <laughs> well, <laughs> well, well, to be fair... 
Flurry Ackerman had famous monsters out, right? So yes. there was that. There was that, but uh, that was not specifically science fiction. Right, it and, was monsters. And once right. again, it... Uh, you know, it, it was not breaking records in terms of sales figures and that sort of thing. What I had to do in order to get our distributor to let us publish the magazine was I had to gather information about all the little fan clubs that were, you know, they were small groups of people. Mm -hmm. But they were all over the country. And I got a list of all the fanzines, which at the time were mimeographed and mailed to the members. Yeah. But I said, there's an audience out there for science fiction, but they're invisible. And yeah. they're waiting for a magazine like this, and they've never had one that takes the field seriously. Because Forey, much as I loved the man, and, and he was a trailblazer in my field, yeah. but he, he did his magazine with a lot of corny humor. Mm -hmm. You know, Forey was, <laughs> right. was having fun with it. Yeah. And so it, right. it, wasn't, it wasn't exactly that he took it really seriously. And Bob, Bob Burns had a magazine for a little while too, didn't he? He might have. I, I, think he, I feel like he did. I don't know right. that for sure. Okay. I but, can't remember. But we, All right, go ahead. We did, we did articles about Bob Burns oh. in early issues of Starlog. Yeah. But anyway, the, the distributor finally agreed to let us publish Starlog, but he said only quarterly, four times a year. Because he said, you have to have sales figures from your first issue to know how to set your print order for your second issue. And that, right. that takes a long time. You can't yeah. do monthly because you've got to have your print order in before you ever know how your last issue sold. Yeah. So we started as a quarterly magazine. And the first issue, there wasn't any science fiction that was alive at the time. There was no science fiction movies being made, mm -hmm. zero. And there was nothing science fiction on television. Star Trek had been off the air. It was in reruns on Channel 9, yeah. you know, and <laughs> that's all that was. So the first issue of our magazine was all about Star Trek. We had a complete episode guide to the original 79 episodes of Star mm -hmm. Trek. And we did interviews with Leonard Nimoy and Gene Roddenberry and, you know, yeah. all, all the, the people involved. And, um, and lo and behold, to everyone's surprise, except me, uh, the first issue sold better. I think, it, if I recall, it sold about 60%. Now, that's wow. really good, because yeah. usually with a newsstand magazine, at least in those days, if you sold 50% or better, you were making money. Mm -hmm. Because, uh, you know, the other magazines got turned back in. If they didn't sell, the, the, the newsstands would turn them back in, and they'd get shredded, turned into pulp. And, is that still the way uh, the, the ratio is? Like, all, you, you have to sell 50% of what you print? I think so, at least. It each magazine is different, yeah. depending on you know, what their costs are, mm -hmm. what the print order is, and that sort yeah. of thing. But, uh, you know, at least our first issue sold well enough that the distributor was impressed. Yeah. And and we started Starlog in 1976, the bicentennial okay. year of the United States of America. And uh, lo and behold, in 1977, something wonderful happened. <laughs> a guy named George Lucas came out with a movie called Star Wars. Sure. And he had right. to sell that really hard to the distributor, to 20th, to get them to, yeah. you know, fund. I mean, that movie, the original movie cost nine and a half million dollars. OK, <laughs> that's all he could persuade them to give him to make the movie. And that was outrageous. I mean, that was a miracle that he got it made at all. Yeah. But he did. And an X-Wing fighter made the cover of Time magazine, and we had that same picture on the cover of Starlog. And suddenly our sales went through the roof, and we went monthly. Ah. And I, when I <laughs> met George Lucas years ago, I said, thank you for making our magazine into a monthly magazine and buying me a classic Cadillac convertible. Nice. <laughs> and then and then George and I discovered that we were both crazy about classic cars, so we talked about that for a long time and yeah. not just science fiction. Yeah. Well that's cool. So so Starlog paved the way for you to be able to do 
uh, Fangoria. Yeah, we, we we published a lot of articles in the first few issues of Starlog that had to do with like Godzilla and Frankenstein mm-hmm. and things. And I said, yeah. you know, that's famous monsters. That's that's not really science fiction in the true sense. Yeah. Science fiction's yeah. about space and 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 ray guns and the future yeah. and that sort of thing. So I said we need another magazine because we discovered that we had fans that loved these articles we did on the monsters. Mm-hmm. So we said um, let's do another magazine and uh, make it about you know a horror. And then yeah. we discovered that our readers were loving the articles that we did about special effects and makeup. I mean, we put, put Rick Baker on the cover of Starlog magazine before anyone knew who he was. Right. And, you know, and we, we in a sense, said, this guy's amazing. He's a star of our world. And the audience, our readers, ate it up. Yeah. So yeah. we discovered that there were a lot of people reading our magazines who wanted to make movies, who wanted to either do special effects or makeup or all kinds of amazing things. So we started a magazine called Cinemagic. And mm-hmm. it was a, it taught young potential filmmakers the techniques of production and special effects, you know, how you could do in your own backyard mm-hmm. what Industrial Light and Magic is doing up in San right. Francisco for gazillions of dollars. So kind of like what everybody looks up on YouTube now. You had a magazine yeah, about right. it. Right. <laughs> That's right. That's right. But but the, but the, the you know the internet did not exist then. Yeah. The only way fans who were kind of closet hidden nerds and who didn't even want to be called trekkies, you remember that? Yeah. They were that was yeah, insulting. Right. Yeah. You know, and so fans were very much in the closet. They were hidden. And yeah. so the only way they could get this information about the weird things they were interested in was through our magazines. And we, yeah. and I remember, I remember getting, uh, taking um, issues of Starlog and then later Fangoria out from our library because the books, the booksellers wouldn't, wouldn't, didn't have it. So the only way I was able to find it was to, you know, I think I wanted to find anything that had to do with Star Wars or special effects or anything, and these and Starlog always came up. So it was they they had it in our library, and I was able to pull those things out uh, and see them. Um, so it was a while before they got into the actual bookstores, but I was you know at least they were in the libraries. That was the that was how that was how I found out about Starlog. Well, that's kind of amazing in itself because we actually had trouble kind of getting uh, some of the newsstands to carry. Fangoria because it was so bloody, you know, and it was, it it was just, it was, they thought it was disgusting and repulsive and, you know, they didn't, that's what people want. Well, (laughs) until, until they found it was selling and then they loved it. (laughs) Well, no, I remember Fangoria used to be up a little bit higher near like the corn mag. (laughs) They used to put it up higher up there You're right. because I would want to look at it. I was like, you know, I was like 12 or 13 and I was like, I want to look at Fangoria, but it's up there, and I don't want people to like kick me out of this place because it was like B. Dalton or something. <laughs> That's book, right. The bookseller. We used to, and and then you're like, if you want to get up there, you gotta like reach for like the penthouses or something. So I had to be real careful to pull them out there and look and look at these things. So uh, I know what you're saying. People were saying probably really um, uh, scared to kind of put it out there. Yes, that's that's true. So. So Cinemagic paved the way for Fangoria, and then Fangoria exploded. The Starlog paved Star- the way for everything. Yeah, and then Cinemagic. And then Fangoria was oh. next. Then oh, Cinemagic. and then Cinemagic. Okay. Then we did Future Life, because we discovered oh, that a lot of our readers, mm-hmm. you know, we did we did articles about space, and, and we would put news items in the, in the front of the magazine in our news section about things that were happening in space in Is those like, days. Like Omni? Like that kind of a thing? It it was a little bit Omni. So we started our own Omni, which was called Future Life. Gotcha. And it it was about not science fiction, but science fact and science and technology. And I had people like Isaac Asimov writing articles for me. And, you know, we we had a different kind of celebrity guest person write an article 
in each issue of Future Life that was called Tomorrow. That was the name of the column. Yeah. And it was whatever they wanted to say about the future of yeah. the human race. Yeah. And, uh, and, and I loved that magazine. And then we also discovered that, you know, in, in Starlog, we ran an, a piece about uh, Flash Gordon. Mm -hmm. And we did uh, a lot of reproductions of the old original Flash Gordon, you know, comic strips. Mm -hmm. And uh, with Alex Raymond's artwork, which is, I mean, he was, he was fantastic. Mm -hmm. And we had audiences love that. And they said, you should do more things on comics. So we started a magazine called Comic Scene, and Stan okay. Lee was on the first cover of Comic Scene. And we, for many years, did a magazine that covered the comics world, too, before that was taken seriously. I mean, there weren't movies about Iron Man and Transformers yeah. and, and X-Men and all that kind of stuff in those days, you know. Again, that was kind of a closeted item that was only enjoyed by a few weirdos. Well, wow, it's all the good weirdos, I think. All the weirdos that are running the world right now. <laughs> well, today, right. today it's the biggest audience on the planet. Yeah. I mean, a new X-Men movie comes out, and you know it's going to make money. There's not even a question. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So you, you built this giant empire that kind of capitalized on, like, every good nerdy thing that was out there. Um, all the things I was interested in. Well, yeah, all the good nerdy things. All the things that we're all still interested <laughs> in. Exactly. <laughs> I mean... <clears throat> You know, all, a lot of the people that we have on the podcast are people that, um, you know, when we ask about, you know, where they got their start or how they got inspired, like so many people say Rick Baker and Fangoria Magazine. Like, mm -hmm. like I'd say most of the people that, you know, work in this town were influenced yeah. by that magazine. Like, I remember the very first thing that, you know, that I did is I, I got a, a Berman Industries catalog, which I saw an ad for in the back of Fangoria, uh -huh. which... In the catalog, there was an ad for a VHS tape on how to make a mask. And I made that mask sitting up there when I was like 10 years old. Yes. Because I saw an ad in the back of Fangoria. Like that's, yeah. well, that, that paved the way for everybody. The people, again, the people who advertised in our magazine suddenly had a vehicle where their ads were appropriate. I mean, yeah. their ads shouldn't mm -hmm. have gone in Time Magazine or, yeah. or Look or, or Vogue or yeah. anything like that. But in our magazines, they were reaching the audience that gobbled it up, and they made a lot of money advertising in our magazines. I was just flipping through an old Fangoria before you came through, and I was looking at the ads in the back. Some of those things are hilarious, like for all these like random like VHS places and oh yeah, like, right. like well there was I remember when I was in Pittsburgh, there was a place called Incredibly Strange Video, and like it was you know it's just like this like hole in the wall like video store that had all the like weird things. It's like oh they got the Faces of Death VHS, and they got all these like weird, you know, kung fu films and stuff like that. Like they had all the weird stuff that, you know, blockbusters never would carry. And I remember, you know, in like the late '90s, I went in there and they were like, "Here's this VHS tape. You should watch this." And it was Blair Witch Project before it was out. Oh wow! Like you know, because oh, wow. that's how they marketed that thing. They gave away like VHS tapes to like uh -huh. all these weird mm -hmm. video stores. But all those guys were the ones that were advertising in your magazine and like looking at those. Like <laughs> that stuff's awesome. Yeah, that's true. That's true. Well, you did it all. Thanks. Huh? You did it all. Thanks. <laughs> well, you're, it's all uh, your. All of this is your fault. It is. Yeah. I, I, Everything I'd, you see before like you to is think your that. fault. Actually, there is a uh, a feature film that's in production right now, a documentary about the evolution of the fan field in the last 40 years and how it has come from the, being the fan magazines or the just fandom. Fandom in general. Okay. But yeah. but but the documentary is I'm it's about me and as, as and the role that I had in kind of helping this happen, because we not only did the magazines, yeah. but, you know, I was never magazines was not my thing. I was a producer. Mm -hmm. I, I liked mm -hmm. production. I liked movies and stuff like that. Yeah. So uh, when we. Uh, when we got the company going where we weren't worried about going out of business next week, yeah. uh, I started a production branch of the company. And by that time, people in the industry were beginning to realize that, oh my God, there's an audience here we hadn't even known about. So I came out here to LA and I hooked up with Paramount. And at that time, home video was just emerging. Mm -hmm. And I said, why don't we do a Fangoria 
series for you, uh, a, a video series. And the very first, it was called Scream Greats. And the very first video that we produced was about Tom Savini. <laughs> and we did, Scream you know, we did a one hour video about him yeah. all, with clips from all the movies in his shop, behind the scenes. And, uh, and Greg, uh, Greg Nicotero, Greg Nicotero was his assistant at yeah. the time. And so Greg was in it <laughs> as well. And, uh, and we it, look that up. I need to see this. I know. Well, it sounds so familiar. I want to say that I've seen parts of it uh, growing you, up. It's, I, it's still good. I mean, oh, I'm sure. Uh, yeah. Check it out. I, when I met Robert I mean, that's Rodriguez. That's pretty much the only place you could see. Like, there was no YouTube. So that's the only place you could. Like, these videos were the only place you could see people working behind the scenes on things. So yeah, exactly. it's no surprise that that would be super popular for anybody that wanted to get into the industry because there was no other way of seeing it. And they sold surprisingly well. And that just encouraged me. I said, let's make movies. And so I wrote a movie script. And I came out here and had meetings with 20th and all kinds of companies. And I was, I had an apartment here in L.A. that I'd come out like one week of every month. And mainly, you know, I was the producer. Yeah. Norman was the publisher at that point. And then, you know, we started working with creation conventions. And we started uh, joining with them on... Uh, doing fan conventions and we did a mm. lot of uh, wonderful fan mm. conventions and I got to meet the fans in person mm. and hear firsthand what they liked and what they didn't like and that to me I told all my editors I said, how do you have time to go to all those conventions every weekend and I said don't you understand that's market research yeah I mean you got to <laughs> talk to the people I mean, we get letters, yeah. so we we heard from people that liked and disliked things mm -hmm. by way of letters. But I would sit down at hotel rooms, you know, in the hallway and, and sit there with fans until three in the morning and talk with them about stuff. And I'd go back to the office and tell our editors, OK, here's what we're going to do. Yeah, because I'd got it directly from the audience. That's and then, you know, we, I, I started producing bigger and bigger conventions. And Gene Roddenberry had become a very good friend of mine who created Star Trek. Yeah. And mm -hmm. um, lo and behold, the 20th anniversary of Star Trek was coming up. So I got together with the boys at Creation <laughs> Conventions, and we said, let's do a huge 20th Star Trek celebration at Disneyland at oh, the geez. Disneyland Hotel, and that's what we did. And I and Gene Roddenberry was there, and Leonard Nimoy was there, and Walter Koenig and Nichelle Nichols, and they'd all become friends of mine by that yeah. time. So we had a huge convention, and some friends from Lucasfilm came down, and they had never been to something like this. And they said, holy cow, there's thousands of people here. And I <laughs> said, duh. <laughs> this sort of stuff goes on every weekend somewhere. Don't you don't you know that this is a huge thing that's happening now? And Lynn Hale, who's head of publicity at Lucasfilm, said, well, you know, Carrie, next year is the 10th anniversary of Star Wars. And I said, Lynn, I will produce a huge 10th anniversary Star Wars convention if you, but I have to have George Lucas there. He, George has to be on stage, mm -hmm. and it'll be a tribute to him. Yeah. She said, no, that won't happen. George George wouldn't do a right. fan convention. <laughs> it's just not going to happen. Well, my friend Howard Rothman was there also, who's been president of Lucasfilm for 30 years, and yeah. as it happens, is my best friend in the world. And so Howard called me a few days later, and he said, Carrie, I spoke to George about this, and he said yes. And mm -hmm. I said, okay. So I wrote the script for George's night that he would appear on stage, yeah. the last night of the convention. And I had R2-D2 and C-3PO come out first. And they did kind of a stand-up Abbott and Costello routine, yeah. you know. And, and Tony Daniels came over from London, yeah. put on the gold costume, and actually played C-3PO. Oh, that's so great. Now, R2 was just remote control. Yeah. But they did a very funny routine, which Tony actually, he looked at my script and he said, you know, Carrie, I think I can help you with your script bit. <laughs> and I said, well, what, what's wrong with it? He said, well, I know how 
C-3PO talks now, perhaps even better than mm-hmm. George does. So I think I can help you with his dialogue. So Tony and I ended up writing the script oh, together. Oh, so great. That's and so cool. After they had done their routine, suddenly in a cloud of smoke, Darth Vader came on stage. <laughs> and I actually I said, I've got to have James Earl Jones' voice. It has to be the real Darth mm-hmm. Vader. Yeah. He was doing a show in New York on Broadway called Fences that's uh-huh. now been made into a movie. Yeah. And so I hung around the stage door. I saw the show at a matinee and I hung around afterwards and I said, ah, Mr. Jones, uh, my name is Kerry O'Quinn and, and I'm producing this tribute to George Lucas. And I, I just wondered if I could possibly talk you into you know, going into a recording studio and recording this little script I have. It's only about five minutes long. And he said, sure. (laughs) So literally a week later, I went into a recording studio in New York and I directed James Earl Jones. Ah, So cool. Crazy script. And we had someone play Darth Vader, but we played back the recording we had. Right. Right. And Darth Vader says, finally, he says, I feel a tremor in the force a power almost greater than mine. And George appears. And the oh, audience so cool. applauded for more than 10 minutes that night. They would not stop. <laughs> and George, awesome. who's, who's not really great with a crowd yeah. like that, he, he just kind of stood there and didn't do anything, just waited till finally they said, he's not going to say anything until we shut up. <laughs> and they finally, they finally got quiet. And George said, hi, thanks for coming. Kerry, isn't somebody going to help me out here? <laughs> so I came out, and we took question from the audience, and the audience got to ask George Lucas questions that night, and it was oh, it's so cool. It was spectacular. And after that, you know, that was that was huge. That was the first ever Star Wars yeah. celebration. So that would have Celebra- been, yeah, that would have been eighty seven. Then that was in eighty yeah. seven. It was to the day, one uh, ten years yeah. after the original movie yeah. had come out. Oh, jeez. Then that 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 is the real precursor to Star Wars Celebration. Then you actually Absolutely. were the first person to do that. Exactly, exactly. And that night, I'm also proud of something else that happened. And and uh, Irv Kirshner was there, and you know oh, a lot nice. of people, not, not just Mark Hamill and Billy yeah. D. Williams and folks like that, but a lot of people that were behind the scenes yeah. at Lucasfilm and part of this world. And I also, I said, I've got a surprise for you, George. I said, I want to introduce a very dear friend of mine who is also part of this world. Ladies and gentlemen, give a welcome to Gene Roddenberry. And Gene came out on stage and shook hands with George Lucas for the one and only time that ever happened. Wow. Wow. Amazing. So anybody (laughs) that was there in 87 was, was witness to to history in the making there actually i think so i mean i wanted it to be history in the making and uh, how many people showed up to that that first one in 87 do you remember it was sold out we put we put as many people as we could into the place that you know the fire people the fire fire marshal fire marshals had a certain regulation on how many it could hold we filled it up yeah and let me just say there was a lot of stormtroopers a lot of luke's and leia's and, you know, th- there were pe- they came in costume. Yeah. And it was outrageous. For three days, they were there. They had a wonderful time. It was a great convention. But that final night on stage with all of those amazing people was something to behold. And stupid me. Fantastic. Stupid me. When I had created this evening... I did not have it professionally videotaped. Oh, no. Oh, man. The only thing I have <laughs> is that there was some girl in the audience that had a video camera. We didn't have cell phones then. <laughs> she had her video camera, and she just held up her camera. It's wobbly, and it's jerky, and it's black and white. But that's the only thing we have that actually shows what went on that night. Oh man! I bet you that tape is worth a lot of money. It is to me. Right? Do you, you should. Uh, you should. Do you have it digitized at least? Well, we're gonna it? we're gonna use part of it in the documentary that's yeah. being done. What's the documentary called? Sure. It's called From the Bridge. Okay. Which was the title of my column that I wrote in Starlog magazine for more than twenty years. It was the yeah. opening 
the opening column, it, from, the letter from the publisher in every issue of Starlog. Mm -hmm. And uh, lo and behold, I discovered once I moved out here to California about 15 years ago, that there's a lot of amazing people who are now very successful in this world who were very much inspired by my From the Bridge columns. Oh, because yeah. Yeah. I knew that sure. I was talking to young people who had you know, unusual dreams that their parents might not understand and their <laughs> teachers might not understand. And even their good friends might think, you know, he's a little off. But I was the voice that said, no, no, no. Take your unusual interests seriously and figure out a way to make your dreams come true. You can do it. And lo and behold, I've discovered people like Guillermo del Toro, and J.J. Abrams, and uh, Michael Gacchino, and so a lot of really amazing people said, you know, your columns kept me going when everything around me was kind of making me wonder if I was doing something stupid. Huh. God, that's got to be a good you feeling. You were. <laughs> it's yeah, it's wonderful. You were, you, were a, you were a beacon out there, certainly, um, because there was nothing else like you uh, in the world at that time, you're yeah, talking like yeah, late seventies, early eighties. I didn't know about all the convention stuff. Like I just was like, ah, oh, the Fangorian Starlog. That's awesome. That's just, well, but those are just the tip of the iceberg. We started, a, a, a Fangoria conventions, which we call yeah. Fangoria's weekend of horrors. Yeah. And, uh, and we did those for many years too. And it, they were horror conventions. Yeah, yeah. And then we did with, again, with creation conventions, we did Starlog conventions mm -hmm. too. But again, I was a guest at a convention literally almost every weekend. Yeah, I would. They would call me. They would fly me out to be a guest, you know. So I was I was loving it, and I learned how conventions work, and what fans really liked, and what they didn't give a damn about. Mm -hmm. And uh, right. so I was able to put together conventions that were a little more fine tuned in in terms of uh, satisfying the audience. Yeah. Now, have you been to Monster Palooza? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I'm just gonna ask. Yeah. yeah, that's a that's a fun one, huh? That's yeah. kinda in LA I I don't think it gets much bigger than that now. I don't I don't go to conventions as much as I yeah. used to, but uh occasionally I get invited and uh and I still go. Yeah, you if, if you haven't been to, to Monster Blues in the past like two years, they just moved to the Pasadena Convention Center. It's it's, yes. it's really nice and big and uh huh. It's pretty awesome. You gotta come. Yeah, I'd love to. All right. Well I'll figure out a way to drag you there next spring. Okay. I was, yeah, for sure. I was. Uh, we we were down in Orlando last year, uh, at what is it, MegaCon or something like that. I can't remember the name of it. No. That's horrible, but uh, but a lot of amazing people were there for that, and we shot a lot of interviews for the, uh, for documentary. the documentary. Yeah, that's great. We're gonna. Our, when our, is the um, our host for the yeah, documentary when... is George Takei. Oh. Wonderful. So, so he's nice. he's our host for the whole thing, and then we have interviews with uh, Nichelle Nichols, yeah. who's a very very dear friend of mine now, and we have interviews with like Gene Roddenberry's son Rod, and Brian mm -hmm. Singer and uh, Stan Lee, and just on and on, including really some people that might surprise you, like Gene Simmons from Kiss. Oh, really? Who yeah. was who was a huge fan? I mean, Kiss bought the back cover ad for Starlog for like the first two years of the magazine. Oh, really? And he explains in what the documentary it? why. <laughs> why? What? Yeah, what was, their, what was their ad? It was for Kiss. Just, just for their records? Yes. Just, uh -huh. just, yeah. <laughs> just, just because they wanted, they said, this is the cool crowd that's yeah. going to tune into our stuff. You know, they were. Yeah. Was it an ad with just. It was just it was just through discography, right? It was just like you know, hotter than hell and live and you know, kiss alive and kiss alive too. Wasn't it just their albums? Pretty much, yeah. Yeah, I think I remember those ads now. Yeah, it's the back cover of the magazine for issue after issue. But I mean, I'm the, the, a surprising people like Gene Simmons, you know, who's not you don't think of him as being involved in the world of science fiction or movies, but our audience extended out beyond that core crowd and uh, mm. reached a lot of people that... Well, uh, I mean, you know, music, you know, whether it's electronic or rock and roll or whatever, like that's all ingrained in the, you know, in the films, like how iconic are 
you know, songs, like you hear a song instantly. Yes. And that brings you right to a movie. I just, um, I, w- <laughs> I went to this thing last week uh, with some friends. We went to this horror trivia at a, at a comic sh- or a, like a collectible shop here in Burbank. I was like, all right, this can't be too bad. I mean, I got a silly podcast about, you know, monsters and stuff. We got our asses kicked. Like we came, our team came in dead last. Like <laughs> it was amazing what some of these people know about horror movies. Like what's the video game that they're playing? The coin operated video game they're playing in the beginning of like Piranha or Piranha 2. I don't know. Do you know? No, no I don't know. It's, it's Jaws, by the way. Oh, um, like, but like, really weird, random stuff. And they had one round where they would play a song, and you have to say what movie that's in the end credits. Not what movie. It's like in the middle of the movie, but right. only in the end credits. <laughs> the only two that we got were uh, Evil Dead, The Evil Dead, because if you only put Evil Dead, it's wrong. The Evil uh. Dead and Shining. Those are the only two we got out of eight. Oh wow! Yeah, no, it was. Jeez, it was well, awesome. I, I've hardcore. Never, I've hardcore. never felt like such an idiot. Oh, but it's, <laughs> it's so great. It was so much fun, and like the questions and the random stuff. But but yeah, so back to that. Like just those little snippets of songs, like bring you back, like mm-hmm. bring you right into it. So of course somebody like Kiss should do that. It makes perfect sense. Yeah, yeah. But you know, uh, Frank, I. I run into fans all the time who expect me to know all of that little trivia stuff. <laughs> you know, they expect me to be the source of all knowledge, and they're way ahead of me on all of it. You know, I mean, I'm I'm not I'm not that into the trivia stuff. Yeah. I mean, we were talking before the show about uh, what what Disneyland is going to open up in terms of their Star Wars oh, yeah, world. Yeah, and yeah. I have friends who are already predicting certain details about what will be going on there. And I don't even know what they're talking about. <laughs> and, and, you know, I've been up to Lucasfilm many times. I've been out to Skywalker Ranch. I actually had my birthday party at Skywalker Ranch a few years ago, which, oh, believe so cool. me, you have to sleep with the right people to do that sort of thing. <laughs> <laughs> but it was great fun. But, but in spite of that, I mean, I love the place and I love everything about it. And I know a lot about it. But uh, there's still a lot of fans that can outdo me if we were on, you know, uh, uh, science fiction Jeopardy. Oh gosh, yeah. They would yeah, they would yeah. win and I would lose. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. I I, uh, I didn't realize how deep some of, some of these people go until I went to this horror trivia. Oh, like yeah. you know, you figure you go to a bar and they have like a trivia night and it's kind of. Mm-hmm. Oh no, we we got our asses handed to us. It was <laughs> it was so much fun though because uh, yeah, it was. We started just putting so, Candyman and Candyman 2 for everything that we didn't know what it was. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Oh, man. Uh, I had a question. Uh, so Starlog, Fangorious, uh, Cinemagic, um, all these are sort of your children. I know it's hard to figure, it's hard to sort of decide what was your favorite. What, what is, but I'm going to ask you, what, what is, what is, who is your favorite? What is your favorite? magazine well, out of all the ones you created they are all my children and in fact to be honest with you at our peak norman and i were publishing two dozen monthly newsstand magazines now a lot of hmm. them were not interesting to me in terms of the subject matter that we just knew there was an audience for them once we got going we were publishing okay we published a magazine called female wrestling okay <laughs> I'm sure there's a pretty big audience out there for that. There, yeah, there sure was. Is. There was for several years. Uh, and teen idols. Yeah. Uh, you know, mm-hmm. which is right, like right. a teen fan magazine, that sort of thing. And there, we, in other words, we had a lot of magazines that we were publishing that uh, that I didn't have any personal passion for. Like, so was that soap opera one still going on through all of it? Like, did that stick no, around for a it, long time? No, it wasn't. Oh. We we stopped it after a few years because, um, to, to be honest with you, I don't remember exactly why, except that partially uh, the fan magazines had kind of taken over our interest. And that's where, you know, we had reached a real audience that was much bigger than even I imagined. And we were reaching them with uh, one new magazine after another. And that just took over our interest, and so we went with those. Yeah. Well, you got to do it to love. But <laughs> to answer your question, uh, 
I have to say that, you know, from the time I was a little kid, I was asking my mother, you know, do you think we'll ever go to the moon? I mean, that was that was so exciting to me. And the old Flash Gordon serials that I used to see that, you know, were made way before my time, but they would sometimes run them as a kind of a short subject with a feature movie, and I would see it, and I was totally in love with the Flash Gordon stuff. And, and anything that I saw, it came from outer space. Mm -hmm. uh, I mean, just mm -hmm. any mm -hmm. science fiction movie that was done in my growing up years was uh, so exciting to me. So science fiction and the future, uh, and the it, it's not just because it's about what possibilities lie ahead for all of us, but because of bringing science and technology into play in a very rational way that actually creates a better tomorrow than what we have today. And that has to be, that makes Starlog my favorite of right. all the magazines, but it's also because it gave birth to everything else. Yeah, right. yeah. Well, the thing about Starlog was that even reading it as a kid, I knew whoever was publishing this magazine, whoever was writing the articles, you could trust them. You knew what they knew what they were talking about. And sometimes I was like, I don't even know what they're talking about because I was so young at the time. <laughs> but I knew that whatever it was that you were saying that you needed to take it seriously because <laughs> this I mean, it was it was not done. You're right in the sense of like uh, famous monsters was sort of kitschy uh -huh. and sort of a wink and a nod to you. Yeah. But Starlog always sort of uh, was always something very, very serious, serious minded. And uh, it didn't it didn't talk so much about the, the special effects necessarily, but about the the thought about the story and how they're telling the story. And uh, and, and that to me was very interesting uh, because it was just a different take on these movies that I had not seen anywhere else. So it showed in the writing and everything else. And I don't know, I, I'm sitting here having this conversation with you and listening to you talk. It brings me back to this time in my life when it was just so. Uh, it was it was there was just so much I, I, I wanted to know about everything. And the only way I could find out was through going to the library and getting magazines and things like that. So I think I speak for a generation of people who read the magazines that they I think people just want to say thank you for those, because it's it. it when I found out we were talking to you, it meant so much to me. Uh, and uh, and and it, I, it really reflected on how much your magazines influenced me and how much I look at things and how much I, I think about how things are done uh, behind the scenes. And it really sort of challenged me personally to to be more creative, I think. So thank you for that, Kerry. That well, means so much. Uh, I, <laughs> you're, you're welcome. But what I was doing was I created a playpen for myself. And uh, I was doing magazines that I had wanted when I was a kid. And I knew that I couldn't be the only weirdo out there. I knew yeah. that there was probably more. And as we began to do more magazines and they all sold and our audience grew and grew and grew. And then we started doing videos and we started doing soundtrack record albums that I produced with Varese Saraband, who's right out here in yeah. your area. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And then we started doing conventions and you know, all the stuff, our audience just grew and I said, holy cow, it's not just that there's a few other weirdos, not just me. I think the whole world is weird, you know? <laughs> They're all our audience. That's well, that's not sure. entirely true, but we, we see today how big that audience is, and the people are not ashamed of being called a geek or a nerd yeah, anymore. No. It's kind of... Yeah. It's like a badge a of honor now. Look at Comic-Con. Every year it started out as a, as a few people that get together and talk about men who wear capes, you know. And now it's <laughs> 150,000 people. Uh, that's and what they tell you. It's like 300,000. <laughs> you can't even buy yeah, a ticket right. now. Yeah. No, it's nutty. It's huge. Yeah, you're going to be up at, what, 9 o'clock tomorrow trying to, trying to get into the hotel <laughs> Exactly. Lottery? Exactly. Oh, yeah, jeez. Oh, yeah. <laughs> I go every year. <laughs> 
I love it. It's yeah. We always end up running into each other. Yes. Me and you and Justin well, and uh, I run Tom into all and, kinds of yeah. people there that I don't see in my day to day life, you yeah. know. And suddenly I see them like once a year. Yeah. Richard Hatch, I would run into, and unfortunately he just died a few months ago. Yeah. He was on Battlestar mm-hmm. Galactica, one of the great actors. I mean, there's people like that that are not you know, dear personal friends, but I've known them for a long time and I run into them at Comic-Con in San Diego. And I'm telling you, I'm still a kid and I'm still a fan and that's thrilling to me. I mean, I, I, I get excited about all that stuff. Oh yeah. (laughs) I hope I never grow too old for that. Yeah. Right. (laughs) So, and I won't. (laughs) No, never, never, never. Um, so at some point, you kind of left the publishing business and you and you moved out here permanently and you've been yes. working on producing and trying to get your own films and stuff like that. What was what was the your reason for exiting the publishing business and and kind of moving away from all of those things? Well, I, I don't want to take the conversation off the topic that we're really involved in here, but I had some things in my life, oh. that, some personal issues. I had someone that was very near and dear to me who died and it put me into a state of depression. And I I was, as I say, I had an apartment here in LA. I was coming out here one week of every month. I had a, I was going to conventions every weekend. I mean, I had a schedule that was uh, constant. Yeah, yeah. And mm-hmm. I tried yeah. for about a year to keep up with that schedule and I just didn't have it in me. And I said, Norman, I got to sell you the company. I've got to go away and find out what I can do from here on that um, that makes me want to be alive. Yeah, sure. And uh, and so that's what I did. I did some strange things. I went back home to Austin, Texas, where I'm from, and I bought a dance club in Austin. And lo and behold, I managed and owned a dance club for a couple of years. But the cool thing about it was it was big mm-hmm. and we had a stage. And so, again, I was able to not just be a bar owner because I was like the only bar owner in town who didn't drink. I didn't drink mm-hmm. alcohol and all the rest of the bar owners were basically alcoholics because yeah. they could get free liquor. And what I was doing is I was producing shows and I brought in the village people and I bought, brought in you know, singers and comedians and we did fashion shows and we did drag shows and we did you know, all kinds of, every week we had a a show. Look at you innovating everywhere. Well, that that was the fun (laughs) part of it. And then when the Austin Chronicle, the the newspaper, uh, kind of the cool local newspaper, they said they voted us the best dance club in town. And I said, it's time to sell. (laughs) When you get that, and sure enough, I sold the place for twice what I paid for it. And I had go, made go money. Go out on a high all, note. Exactly. Yeah. And I said, I, this is not the way I'm going to spend the rest of my life anyway. Yeah. And so I went off and I said, you know, I'm going to do something else. And I, I met a young man who had had a very unfortunate childhood. I fell totally in love with him and adopted him as my son. And he's the one who got me to move out here to California when he became a policeman here in L.A. And... Uh, and, you know, I had the adventure of fatherhood, which I never thought I, I've been single all my life. So, you know, I'd never had that adventure. Mm-hmm. And uh, so I've, I've done a lot of interesting things since I sold the magazines. Yeah. But God knows that was a, a formative and an important period of my life yeah. that will always be important to me. Yeah, that's cool. And then, and then now you have some other some other films you're working on trying to producing get going and and i've written a book yeah i I, people like like jj abrams and and various people like that said you know you should take all those editorials you wrote and you should just collect them into a book compile them and i said no i don't really want to do that first of all they were you know they were on various topics uh, about a convention i went to or someone i met or uh, some whatever trip i made whatever and i said that's that's not a book so I said, but the underlying theme of all my editorials for all those years was always, you can do it too. Make your dreams come true. So I said, mm-hmm. I'm going to write a book from scratch. 
and I have, and it's called Reach for the Stars, uh, A Practical Guide to Making Your Dreams Come True. And I am, in addition to my own nine chapters, a step-by-step guide to how you can do the impossible. Yeah. It is also, I'm also doing interviews with a lot of amazing people who have indeed made their dreams come true. And uh, I'm going to include interviews with about 20 famous people. So you not only hear my words of encouragement, yeah. but you hear what they have to say about you know, what they've learned in terms of how you do amazing things. That's great. Excellent. Well, can't wait to read so that one. So there's, I, I have, I have a lot of different projects that are uh, on the table right ah, now. That's so cool. Yeah. Plus I'm trying so to, the, I've written a horror script that I'm trying to set up financing on. If anybody wants to help on that, it's only about a three and a half million dollar budget. Yeah. And, that's, and I'm going to, nothing these days. I'm going to kill yeah. over a dozen famous celebrities in the horror field. I've already talked to most of them. Uh, Robert Rodriguez said he would executive produce it. Uh, I met Quentin Tarantino a couple of years ago, and I said, I've got you written into my script. I said, you're going to have one line, and you're going to die horribly. He said, tell me when. (laughs) So, I mean, everybody I've talked to so far has said, yes, they'll do it. So it's going to be a fun movie that you, you're you going to scream one minute and you're going to laugh the next minute. Yeah. And it's called Drag Worms. Ah, there you go. <laughs> nice, nice. So the documentary, uh, is there a release date for that? Is that coming out no, anytime there's not. soon that we're, we can look We're for? not entirely finished with it. There's still a few interviews that we're waiting to do. There's about three more interviews that we want to get. People have already said yes. Yeah. And the producer, I'm not the producer or the director, but uh, he is negotiating now with uh, distributors and Netflix and all those business negotiations that he's going through. And all the fun part of filmmaking. Yes. (laughs) Well, it, 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 I learned it can be fun too. When I started my own company and learned how to keep books and do business. Yeah. And lo and behold, I discovered that, you know, business is not as dull and dry as I always thought it was. It is my least favorite part of the day, though. Well, yeah. <laughs> the creative stuff, I mean, when you're a creative soul, that's what you live for. Yeah. And you do the other stuff because it enables you to do creative things. Yeah, no, absolutely. Speaking of being able to do creative things, uh, we have some people to thank yes. uh, for letting us do our thing here at Creature Geek. Frank, uh, if you want to read the list off. Yeah, thanks to everybody chipping in over at Patreon. Uh, you're the guys that put the money in the tip jar that fill up my beer fridge. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> two favorite people in the world, Jason Moore and Eric Seglum. My third favorite person in the world, Kevin Oaks. And yes. there's Chris LRB, Bob Lackey, Brian Warner, Gerard Libby, Robert Burns, Charles Babbage, Eddie Haleco, Ricardo Murillo, Eric Mullins, Raymond Stanek, Sinanico Don Sedonico, and John Cripps. <laughs> nice. Thanks, nice. guys. You said Robert Burns. Is that is that Bob Burns? No, no, no. Oh, that's, okay. not, oh. that's not that's not the Bob Burns. <laughs> no, I yeah, haven't seen go. Bob Burns in a while. He's uh his, he, I think his his health is a little a little shaky. Yeah. Yeah. I know he's, that he's uh, Frank Dietz was Frank Dietz had some pictures with him recently. So. Yeah. Yeah, he's he's uh, still alive. Yeah, but yeah. There he is. Um, and I know you are, you are old school, Carrie, but do you do anything? Do you do, do you do Twitter? Do you do Facebook? Any place people can find you? They want to find more about you and your projects that you're coming up. Do you have anything you want to plug? I do a little bit of Twitter and a little bit of Facebook. I think I have something up there and, you know, uh, for a long time, people were posting pictures of Terry O'Quinn on my Facebook and they were posting pictures of me on his. I finally (laughs) met Terry O'Quinn at Comic Con a few years ago and got a picture of the the two of us together, the O'Quinn boys. And uh, you know just that's John Locke from Lost. (laughs) That's right. That's right. (laughs) I I actually went to a party at JJ Abrams uh, Bad Robot once because it was a lost party and I said, I'm finally gonna meet Terry O'Quinn. I was dying to and I got there, and JJ said, "I've got bad news for you. He couldn't come tonight." Oh. So I was I was <laughs> devastated. But finally, I met him at Comic Con, and uh, so I that was that was a big thrill. 
<laughs> nice, nice. I mean, so what is what do you do you remember your Twitter handle so people can follow you? Oh, oh. we could look it up and throw it in the show notes. Yeah, for you. I, ho- I look hope up you Carrie can. O'Quinn with a K. Yeah, that's a, right. Not yeah. not a T. It's it's Carrie as in Washington. Yeah. K E R R Y, right? That's right. Yeah. Or as in John yes. Kerry. Yeah. Yeah, we'll uh, we'll yes. we'll look up all those details and we'll throw it into the show notes so everybody can give you a follow and exactly. hear what you have to say and hopefully you'll post up news when people can see this documentary when your oh yeah your horror film gets like you know people are rabid and they want to hear all this stuff and see all this stuff so well uh, w- when I have something to promote believe me I'll be I'll be loud and clear about it and <laughs> then uh, you're always we'll be, welcome yeah. back here if you ever want to. Well, That's right. You. We'll be your mouthpiece as well, too. We'll get to, this, we'll get the word out as well. It's delightful to talk with both of you, and uh, it's it's on oh. things that I love. And uh, well, it's an honor to have you here. Well, absolutely, it's, it's delightful. Absolutely. Delightful to be here. Well, thanks, Carrie. Thank you. Thank you so much, Carrie. Uh, by the way, if you want to find Frank and I on Twitter, we are frankipolito.com or tw- uh, lenperalta.com, or we are also Frank Ippolito and Len Peralta on Twitter. Uh, you can also visit us. Thanks for everybody at Tested.com for giving us a home. Uh, you can also visit us online at Creature-Geek.com or visit our Patreon if you are, are inclined to give us some money. Patreon.com forward slash Creature Geek. Uh, and if you have any comments, go to Tested.com or write us at Len at Creature-Geek.com or Frank at Creature-Geek.com and he will not write you back. Carrie, <laughs> uh, thank you so much. It was an honor having you, as Frank said, on the show. Thank you. And thank you for all the years of uh, Starlog, Fangoria, and everything else you've done. Uh, it, you, you've been a huge inspiration to so many people, and it's been an honor having you on Creature Geek. So thank you so much for having me. I was being. having fun all the way. All right, cool. Excellent. Right. We, will, we will see you on the next episode of Creature Geek coming up next hopefully week, probably. Next week. Take care. Yeah, hopefully next week. Take care of everybody. Bye. All right. Wow, that was great. Yeah. That was terrific. Well, thank cool, you. man. Um, huh. all right, Len, I will, uh, he's got to get to a, uh, dinner, he's got dinner plans and I got to get the hell out of here too. So. All right. Hey, well, it was great meeting you, Carrie. Good Thank you so much. And I hope and, uh, we cross paths face to face someday. I, I, I hope so too. I hope so too. This show will be up on Friday too, just yeah. so you know. Yeah. I'll, so. uh, I'll shoot you a link. Yeah. Give, give me information sure. and I will, yeah. I will tweet about it and oh, cool. do, do some stuff like that. Yeah. All right. Excellent. Thank you so much. Take cool. care, everybody. Bye. All right. I don't know why I stopped.